Well, hello, and thank you for coming. My name is Liz Tenterelli. I'm president of the League of Women Voters of New Hampshire, and I'm especially thanking the New Hampshire Humanities for sponsoring this program. Um, so let's see, we'll, we'll use these arrows to advance. So back in 2019, when we realized we were approaching the centennial of women getting the right to vote, I decided it was time to put together all my gathered notes about women's history, especially voting, and prepare this uh, program. And I did that for two reasons. One, because it's important that women finally got the right to vote, but also because as president of the League of Women Voters, we too were approaching our centennial. We're a direct descendant organization of the women's suffrage movement. When women finally got the right to vote, uh, the, the suffragists realized now women needed to know how to do it, how to study issues and so on. And so that, that's why I was doubly pleased to put this together, little dreaming that 2020, the actual centennial would throw us all for a loop. Uh, but here we are a few years later and we're still celebrating, so that's fine. So as I talk about women getting the right to vote, I want to make the point that that was an important thing, but it was only part of a much larger movement of women working for their civil rights. And so I will constantly be talking about a civil rights struggle that women were engaged in for about 200 years at least. And the very first one was when we th start thinking about uh, getting rid of slavery. And there were many women who were part of the abolition movement in this country. Two of them are the Grimke sisters from South Carolina. You can imagine that speaking out against slavery in South Carolina in the 1820s and 30s was not very popular. And when they tried to do that, they were silenced. Uh, people threw things at them and so on not only because it was an unpopular opinion, but because they were women. They said, women don't speak in public. They don't take stands on these. And so the Grimke sisters and many others realized that certainly the slaves had their civil rights infringed upon just by slavery, but women also were being restricted. And so now we're going to get to some people whose names may be familiar to you, Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. These photos show them in their mature years, but in fact, in 1840, when they first met, they were both young women, and they met at an international abolitionist conference in London. And they had gone there fully expecting to be part of the conference because they'd been active in this country they got there and they were told, oh, no, no, you ladies go sit up in the balcony and we don't want to hear from you. Well, you don't tell Elizabeth Cady Stanton that you don't want to hear from her. So that's how these two met. And they said, when we get back to the United States, we're going to fix this. Well, it took eight years, but eventually these two women and some of their friends organized the first women's rights convention at Seneca Falls. Falls, New York, that's upstate New York, uh, in July of 1848. For that convention, there were 300 people who attended, men and women. Uh, they drafted the Declaration of Sentiments and Resolutions. Eleven of those resolutions passed unanimously. They were demanding civil rights, such as access to higher education, access to the professions, um, standing in courts of law, uh, rights over their children, rights over their own wages so that it did, didn't automatically revert to husbands and fathers and so on. So as I said, there were 11 of those that, that passed unanimously. The attendees said, yes, these are civil rights that women demand. But the 12th, was one that Elizabeth Cady, hi, come on in, uh, that Elizabeth Cady Stanton had added, and it was the right to vote. Now, when that came up, a couple of things happened. 
One was that there was great argument about it. How, you know, how can we do this? You know, will we be made a laughing stock? In fact, when Elizabeth Cady Stanton's husband saw that she was putting in this, he left town. He left her. He was very, very supportive up until then. He just cleared out. It wasn't until Frederick Douglass, the former slave who was attending this conference, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton both spoke passionately that the right to vote is so central to gaining your other rights that it must be included in this. So you see now, it, what, it didn't start out as the right to vote, it started out with the civil rights. So where did these uppity women in New York State ever get the idea that they had equal rights with men or should have them? Well, frankly, they got it from their neighbors, the Haudenosaunee. This is, uh, is, was a loose federation of six Native American tribes in New York State and Canada. They're also called the Iroquois Confederacy, but Haudenosaunee was the name they used. And the women in those tribes had amazing rights. For instance, they controlled the property. The women owned it. Uh, they had a say, more than a say, they had control over the fate of their children. If a woman died, her children wouldn't be the property of her husband. They'd be the property of her brother, her, her, the, the male relatives on the woman's side. They had a voice in choosing the chief of the tribe and whether or not the tribe would go to war or draft a peace treaty. So many of these women, especially Matilda Gage uh, at the first women's rights convention knew how Denisoni women and knew what they had as rights. And I think some of them said, we'll have what she has, you know, <laughs> why shouldn't we have those same rights? Now, here's another name that will be familiar to you from 11th grade history, Susan B. Anthony. She was not at that 1848 convention, but she came a few years later, 1851, met Elizabeth Cady Stanton. And from then on, the two, these two women dedicated their lives to the cause of women's suffrage. Sojourner Truth, former slave, uh, also went to the 1851 convention and gave her famous Ain't I a Woman speech. Now, Sojourner Truth was illiterate, so there are various versions of this speech as people frantically tried to write it down while she was speaking, making the point that Black women, as much as white women, had the right, had, had, needed civil rights. They were making the same demands. So from the early days of the movement, there were blacks and whites, men and women in the movement. So let's talk for a bit about some of these rights they were fighting for. I mentioned them already, right to their own wages, to property. At this point, if, you, um, if your husband died, you did not automatically inherit that property. It went to the male son. And so the only women who owned property in, 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 in the broadest sense would be wealthy widows without male children. And then they had some legal rights. Um, divorce laws, those were very restrictive for women. Now, one thing that surprised me when I found it out is in the early years of our country, women actually had the right to vote that it only happened gradually that they were written out of the state constitutions. And so until 1784 in New Hampshire, women had the right to vote. Did that mean they were voting? Well, no, because of these other restrictions. In those days to be a voter, you had to be a property owner and a taxpayer. And as I've just said, the other laws conspired to make it impossible for all but a few wealthy widows to be property owners and taxpayers. But it is interesting that the state constitutions did not specify male voters. So women had that right, gradually written out. Here's another name you probably remember from 11th grade, Lucy Stone. 
she was actually a property owner. I'm not sure how that happened in New Jersey. And in the uh, 1850s, some women were claiming that, recognize this phrase, taxation without representation, that catchword of the revolution applied to them. That is, they were being asked to pay taxes, but not being able to vote for representation. And so Lucy Stone refused to pay her taxes. The authorities took her furniture and sold it at auction to make up for that. And then I found out afterwards that her neighbors said, well, that's not right. And so they bought back her furniture and returned it to her. But women were trying to come up with reasons that would satisfy the government, the state and local governments about why they should vote. But as this is happening, and they're trying to work for some of those civil rights in the states, of course, the Civil War is heating up. And remember, many of them started as abolitionists. That was their first real cause. And they said, we'll put aside our arguments for now and fight for the freedom of the slaves and the 13th Amendment. And in fact, one of the few legal rights that women had was the right to sign a petition. And the uh, women suffer what we call now the suffragists managed to gather 400,000 signatures on petitions for the 13th Amendment, which would abolish slavery. It, it did, it passed, but you know, then the 14th Amendment was needed to say not only is slavery abolished, but those freed slaves now need to be considered as citizens. And that's what the 14th Amendment, the Equal Protection Under the Law Amendment, was working towards. It was the 15th Amendment that got to be a real sticking point. This was going to grant freed slaves the right to vote. The 14th Amendment didn't quite do it. So the 15th Amendment was drafted. And at, at that point, you know, when that was just, just the notion was just starting, Stanton, Stone, Frederick Douglass, Susan B. Anthony, and many others formed the American Equal Rights Association, black and white men and women for universal suffrage. Let's make that 15th Amendment apply to the freed slaves and to women and to non-property owners. Well, as we know, that's not what happened. So that what we had was a split in the women's suffrage movement between Lucy Stone and Frederick Douglass and others who said, this is the Negro's hour. We must at least get this amendment passed that guarantees freed black men the right to vote because without it, they will never be able to move ahead in society. And Stanton, Anthony, and others said, no, 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 don't give up on this because it'll be decades before women get the right to vote. They were right, it was, because the amendment was passed guaranteeing only male freed slaves the right to vote. So that takes us right up to 1869 and 1870 when the amendment was passed. And now I'm going to back away from that a little bit to talk about some of the other changes going on in society. Now, for years, women, of course, had worked in the home. They had worked as domestics in other people's homes, but they had not gone out in droves into what we call, we call industry now. But by the 1820s, that was starting to happen with the Industrial Revolution. And the farm girls from all around here in New Hampshire were going to the mills in Lawrence and Lowell and Dover, New Hampshire, and so on to work in uh, terrible conditions, long, long hours for pennies. But hey, it was better than living on the farm. You know, That's what many of them thought. They were at least out on their own. And so we have large groups of women for the first time being out in the labor force, and they started organizing. 
So first they, they, you know, said, we'll do this. That's our right to go get these jobs. But then they said, now it is our responsibility to try to improve those jobs. So they started arguing for better working conditions. They testified the Massachusetts legislature for a 10 hour work day. They didn't win that one. The very first women organized labor strike uh, happened in Dover, New Hampshire at the Cochico Mills when the mill owners said, we're going to cut the wages by 5%, not cut the hours, just your wages. Oh, and we're only going to do that to the female workers. And these mill girls said, no, you can't do that. They went on strike. Unfortunately, there were so, more, so many more farm girls willing to come take their jobs that they lost that too. They had to give up the strike and go back to work. And it really was not until 1911, with the, uh, 1912 rather, with the big bread and roses strike down at the mills in Lawrence, Massachusetts, that the working conditions for these mill workers both the mill girls and the many uh, immigrant men who worked in the factories began to change. But what happened during those years? Women were finding their civic voices. They were speaking up for their own labor rights, their own right to safety. Now, this picture was sent to me by my friend who now lives in Ireland. Margaret Hinchy was an Irish immigrant and she worked in what we would call one of the New York City sweatshops. And in fact, she is a survivor of the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire that you may have heard about, 1911. So this, as I said, was a sweatshop. The women were on the upper floors surrounded by textiles, very flammable. When it caught fire, they could not escape because the doors had been locked for two reasons. One, to keep women from taking unauthorized breaks, but also to keep labor organizers out. And so it ended up with 146 people perishing in that fire. Uh, Margaret Hinchy was one of the survivors. They were jumping out windows and so on. And at that point, Margaret Hinchy and a, another uh, immigrant worker named Rose Schneiderman and many others started using their civic voices for labor conditions in the city. So immigrant voices have now joined that women's suffrage, women's civil rights uh, voice. Just before COVID, I did get down to Washington, D.C., where the Smithsonian had a wonderful women's suffrage exhibit. And this is one of the authentic wagons that was used in the early 1900s. They would cart this around to public demonstrations for women's rights. And uh, you can see on the, the blackboard part of it, it says, eight million working women need the vote equal pay for equal work. Have we heard that phrase before? Yes. Uh, so that's the labor voice. Below that, it says 90% of the teachers are women. The nation needs intelligent voters. And if I had my pointer here, I'd use it to show you on the right. It says women's journal, uh, votes for women, women's journal, price only five cents. So the women by, let's say 1900, were using any device they could to get attention. They were publishing very inexpensive newspapers, giving them away, selling them very cheaply, carting things around as they spoke in public, doing handouts, all of that. Um, so I felt very lucky that I got to see this in person. Now again, let me back away a little bit from labor and voting and talk about some other ways that Americans were looking at women a little differently because of a few extraordinary women. And on the left is Annie Smith Peck, a world-renowned mountaineer, the, the first person to climb Peru's highest mountain. And then in 1911 went to another uh, one of the Peruvian peaks and planted a votes for women pennant on the top. Don't you wish you could have seen that? 
Dr. Elizabeth Blackwell was the first woman to be admitted to a medical school in the United States. Uh, she had come from England. She had some medical training, wanted to be a doctor. She applied to medical schools all, all over the Northeast. And she was so much better qualified than most of the men that Geneva Medical College in upstate New York said, it's hard for us to say no to her. But they didn't want to let a woman in. So they decided to put it up to the student body for a vote. And the men, students said, this has got to be a joke. Or either that, let's let her in and watch her faint at the sight of blood. So on a lark, the men admitted, men students uh, said they would admit Elizabeth Blackwell. Well, not only did she not faint at the sight of blood, she graduated at the top of her class. So remember that was one of the civil rights that the women wanted, access to higher education and to the professions. And Elizabeth Blackwell served, checked both of those boxes. Clara Barton is a name you've heard as the founder of the Red Cross. She organized nurse corps during the Civil War and then uh, learned about the Red Cross in Europe and single-handedly founded that in this country. So we have these extraordinary women doing things that make the public think, hmm, women can do some things, but they're not convinced yet, right? These are extraordinary women. By the time we get to the progressive era, the 1890s, we have more and more women stepping up to do these things, one of whom is Jane Addams. Now today we would call her a social worker. At the time, she lived in Chicago. She bought an inner city property called Hull House. She hired young women, middle class women, to come and live and work in Hull House and then invited the poor women, the immigrant women, and men too, but you know, most of them were women, into Hull House to learn about sanitation, child nutrition, um, learn English, uh, learn civics so they could become citizens. All of this was being done as more or less a volunteer basis. And it turned out there were eventually 400 of these what they called settlement houses, primarily in the Northeast, some of which were started by Black women exclusively for Black neighborhoods. So women are making their mark. They don't have rights particularly, but they see a need. They're using their civic voices. And so the next group I want to talk about is the General Federation of Women's Clubs, founded in 1890. This was also uh, middle class to upper class women who wanted to improve society. And they banded together in a social way to undertake projects, which is what the Federation of Women's Clubs still does to improve society. And by 1914, they had signed on as official members of the suffrage organization, realizing that was needed as well. Here is a name you may recognize, Margaret Sanger. She got a bad reputation for some things a little bit later in her life, but I'm not gonna touch on them here. But what she did around 18, 95 to 1910 was try to spread information about birth control. It was illegal at that time to discuss birth control or to sell devices. If women were having more children and having them at a faster rate than they wanted, they would be at a great disadvantage. You can't control your own life and move forward with things. If you're constantly having children, you may love them all, but you know, 14 is a lot. Or whatever. So um, she tried to, she violated the laws. She was jailed. She taught women about the rhythm, what we call now the rhythm method of birth control. She imported diaphragms from Europe. And as I said, she was jailed, but for the first time, women were getting a glimmer that they had control over their reproductive lives. And if they could control that, they might be able to move into 
the professions and some other th things. Let's look at New Hampshire specific things. This wonderful photo is from the New Hampshire Historical Society, 1915. And that is a group of suffragists. You'll notice there are men there as well. And this was true. It was not a male versus female argument. There were men who fought for suffrage. There were women who opposed it. In New Hampshire, we especially found men taking active roles in the suffrage organization, often as the either the president or the treasurer or uh, some important role. But I just love this, this photo. Isn't this wonderful how many of them gathered right there? Here is another New Hampshire connection from up near Cornish, north of here. Julia Rubley was a wealthy woman. She was the grand marshal of the big 1914 suffrage parade in DC, on, shown on her horse here. Here's a name that may be familiar to you, Mabel Hark and Churchill, also of Cornish. Uh, she was the wife of Winston Churchill, not the prime minister. This is the other Winston Churchill who ran for New Hampshire governor. He was a well-known writer, uh, and she was uh, instrumental in forming the suffrage organization up there in Cornish. And if you're into the arts, you recognize Maxfield Parrish. He and his wife were very active in the organization. I'll move over to Concord, where Armenia White and her husband, Nathaniel White, very wealthy, maybe the wealthiest family in Concord, went to one of these women's rights conventions in 1868 and vowed that upon getting back to the state, they were going to start a New Hampshire women's suffrage organization, which they did. And she served as its president almost until her passing. She was also an abolitionist, as was her husband. Their house was a stop on the Underground Railroad. But what you also notice is a third organization here, the New Hampshire Women's Christian Temperance Union, and she served as its president. So if you've never heard of this organization, this was a group of women founded in, in the 1880s, I've forgotten the exact year, to try to change society's attitude toward liquor. Men were getting off work, going to the bars, drinking up all their wages, coming home and beating their wives and children. I realize I painted that with a broad brush, but it was a big enough and common enough problem that women were banding, banding together uh, for what would eventually be prohibition first trying to change societal attitudes, but then eventually prohibition. So you have in Armenia White that triple threat, abolitionist, prohibitionist, and of course, a suffragist. Now, a friend of the Whites was US Senator Henry Blair from New Hampshire. And he was the first US Senator to speak on the floor of the Senate in 1886 in favor of a federal amendment giving women the right to vote. So that's a long time before it finally passed. He spoke for it, we should be proud of him. He was from New Hampshire, but it got defeated two to one. So it, the time was not yet ripe. In spite of the fact that the first calls for suffrage began in 1848. So you see, we've got a long arc here. Now, this is my favorite New Hampshire suffragist, Marilla Marks Ricker, born in New Durham. Uh, she married a very wealthy older man who passed away, which left her a wealthy widow and property owner. She used some of her wealth to study law. She became a lawyer in Washington, D.C. When she came back to New Hampshire, she wanted to practice law in what was then her hometown of Dover, New Hampshire. And uh, they, they said, nope, the, the New Hampshire Bar Association said, nope, you can't practice law, why? Because she's a woman. So she sued the Bar Association and won. 
She never ended up practicing in New Hampshire, but she opened that profession to women in the state. Now in 1870, she first tried to vote as a property owner and taxpayer in Dover. And she went up there to the polls and said, I'd like to vote. I'm over 21, I'm of sound mind, I'm a taxpayer, give me a ballot. They didn't, but she tried that every year for the next 50 years. And she passed away in November of 1920, just days after the first election in which women were voting nationwide. Sadly, she had suffered a stroke several years before, and we have not been able to find any evidence that she was able to cast a ballot. We think she probably didn't, but she knew it was coming and that other women were voting. So in 1910, Marilla Rick, 10 years before women have the right to vote, Marilla Ricker wants to run for governor. And I'm gonna read what she said about that. She said, I'm going to run for governor, although I have not the slightest idea of ever becoming governor, I'm running in order to get people into the habit of thinking of women as governors. You know, people have to think about a thing several centuries before they can get acclimated to the idea. I want to set the ball rolling. So she went to file papers and she was denied filing papers. Why? Because she wasn't a registered voter. Well, not for lack of trying. She'd been doing trying for 40 years. So in 2016, uh, the New Hampshire Bar so Women's Bar Association and the League of Women Voters raised funds in order to have a portrait of Marilla Ricker painted. And the man standing on the right there is uh, Representative Rennie Cushing, who passed the legislation to get her portrait to hang in the state house. So the next time you're in the state house, say hi to Marilla Ricker. Rennie has sadly passed away already, but we had a wonderful time. And you see uh, then Governor Maggie Hassan at the unveiling ceremony. All right, so here is another New Hampshire suffragist, Sally Whittier Hovey of Portsmouth. And she was allied with the more militant group of suffragists in the 19 teens uh, under Alice Paul. Um, and she was very active at, at the national level. She picketed the Republican convention in 1920 because they weren't coming out for a speedy ratification of the amendment. And then no sooner did we get the, um, the, the 19th amendment giving us the right to vote then Alice Paul's party, including Sally or Whitty, Whitty or Hovey, started lobbying in DC for a women's rights amendment, which we still don't have in the constitution, as you know. This photo was given to me by a league friend in Nashua. That's her grandfather standing in front of the truck and her grandmother is one of the two women in the truck. This was a suffrage parade, and all those women piled into the trucks were being driven through Nashua, uh, arguing for suffrage. So we had a lot of different things going on, different kinds of activities to try to get public attention. Remember our, our Grimke sisters who were almost stoned for speaking in public? Well, by 1900, we've got women like uh, the Reverend Dr. Anna Howard Shaw making speeches from the back of a car on Wall Street and getting a hall where they could give speeches on suffrage. These are before TV and movies, remember. This was good entertainment to go hear a speech. By 18, the, the late 1890s, early 1900s, the original suffragists, people like Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton are now well into their 90s or 80s. Um, people have gotten tired of them. They're saying the same thing. They're wearing their same dowdy dresses. <laughs> and we needed a spark to move us over the finish line. 
and along come some of the wealthiest women in New York City, the so-called 400 families. And some of those women have been referred to as the gilded suffragists, that's from the gilded age. Uh, these were women who did a number of things for their own rights. For instance, some of them banded together to buy a property and build a club for women. Now, men had had clubs for years. And they, you know, yeah, dear, I'm, I won't be home tonight. I'm having dinner at the club. You know, now women are going to do the same thing. And when they get to these clubs, they're going to discuss issues, including suffrage, including birth control. Their daughters are going to college. They're going to talk about what they're learning in college and the rights that they're expecting. So this is one of those famous New York 400 families, Catherine Dewar McKay. And here's another one, Alva Vanderbilt Belmont. Yes, she was one of those Vanderbilts. When she divorced her ne'er-do-well husband, uh, she got Marble House in the settlement. That's one of those Newport mansions Nowadays, we can go buy a ticket and walk through it. Well, you couldn't back in 1900. Uh, these were private residences. She shocked Newport higher society by selling tickets and opening her house for tours to raise money for suffrage. And she did. Thousands of people bought these tickets uh, and went through. And she became the, the great financial backer of Alice Paul's National Woman's Party. This was an era when um, the newspapers were following the goings on of these wealthy women. It was the gossip column era. And it would say what people wore to these fancy parties. And so they'd have a ball for suffrage. And it would all be reported and, and photos of what the women had worn. And that sparked interest, not just among wealthy women, but among ordinary women who were reading about this in the newspapers. And so it was reborn as a stylish thing to be a suffragist. Just in time, because Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Lucretia Mott, Susan B. Anthony, Lucy Stone, they were all dead before 1920. Now they'd been in this, you know, for decades. So some of these wealthy women started staging big parades in New York City. You have to realize New York State was like the equivalent of California today. It was the largest state, was the most influential state. And they were arguing not necessarily for a federal suffrage amendment, but for suffrage rights in the state. They wanted to change the state constitution. So this most famous picture of the littlest suffragist in one of these early New York City parades is just so marvelous. But look at what you're seeing. You're seeing they're carrying banners, they're wearing sashes, they're wearing suffrage hats. The women had learned to market suffrage. Some of them were even doing radio interviews, things that, you know, some of these well-bred women had never done before. One of the women who organized marchers for one of these New York City parades was Mabel Pinghua Lee, born in China, educated in New York City, had a PhD from Columbia, and she organized other Chinese women to march in this parade. Now, Elizabeth Cady Stanton's daughter, Harriet Stanton Blatch, was organizing labor women to march in the parades. And so this suddenly became this big melting pot of foreign-born labor class, laboring class, and the wealthy. Um, and you'll see why at the end of my presentation, why I love this picture of Mabel Lee organizing people. What else did they do? Well, cars had been invented. Roads were terrible. The cars were not very reliable. But the top photo shows two of the suffragists and their cat who made a five-month trip across the country and then back via another route, stopping in towns along the way to distribute suffrage literature and to give speeches about suffrage. 
and women are still getting petitions signed. And so now they're working on a petition for a federal suffrage amendment. And they collected 75,000 signatures, delivered them to Congress in an 80 car caravan in the kind of doing the last stretch together as a caravan, uh, all driven by women. These cars were driven by women at a time when there were not a lot of women driving, but they found enough to do it. The biggest publicity stunt, if you want to call it that, for women's suffrage occurred in 1913 with this big parade in New York City. Now, in November of 1912, Woodrow Wilson had been elected president, first Democrat in almost two decades. And in those days, the inauguration was held in March, not in January. So it was the inauguration was to be March 4th. The women planned their suffrage parade in D.C. for March 3rd. They'll take advantage of the crowds. And if you think Wilson wasn't annoyed by this, you'd be mistaken. He was very annoyed at being upstaged. We have some wonderful photos of this parade. This was a, a pageant that was staged on the steps of the Treasury Building. Women came from all over the country representing their local suffrage organizations, representing different states. There were women-only horseback units and women-only bands marching in the parade. They marched by groups. This photo is labeled homemakers, and you can see they've created a kind of costume for themselves. In this next slide, you see college students, perhaps a sorority, uh, marching in the parade, and that's what those banner uh, garlands would signify. So these are young women. There were somewhere between five and 10,000 women marching in this new, uh, Washington DC parade. One of the groups that had a little trouble getting permission to march was Delta Sigma Theta sorority from nearby Howard University, a black university, so a black sorority. Their advisor was Mary Church Terrell. She was perhaps one of the best known internationally suffragists. She is a black woman, although she, you can see very light skinned. And she argued that these women should be allowed to march with the other college women. They were marching in groups, librarians, teachers, college students, and so on. The organizers of the parade had worries about this for two reasons. One is that in 1913, Washington was a segregated city. So having an integrated parade and integrated right in the parade was a worry that maybe some of the white women would refuse to march, but also a fear that there might be violence. And um, that, that was not an unreasonable fear. So another black woman who wanted to march was the famous journalist Ida B. Wells. She was the only black woman representing Illinois and she fully expected to march with the Illinois unit. But when the parade was held up for three hours by spectators who didn't want this parade, first because it was women, second because there, was, there were signs of integration in the parade, um, she, she was uh, told by some of the parade organizers maybe you could go and march with one of the black units. Well, she stepped out of the parade route, blended in with the crowd, but three hours later when the parade finally got started, she simply stepped back into the parade and marched with the Illinois women exactly where she wanted to march. So it was a, a very dramatic event, but not without its problems. So here is Woodrow Wilson and his blushing bride. Wilson was a Southerner born and raised. He was not an uh, opponent of women's suffrage, but because he was a Southerner, he believed in states' rights. And that is, if states wanted women to get the vote, the states should pass those laws. And as you know, even today, each state sets up the details of its voting laws within the, the larger parameter of the federal constitution. 
So he was not in favor of a federal amendment, which is what they were pushing for by now. Um, let's talk about what other opposition there was to suffrage. First of all, there was a well-known national organization opposed to women's suffrage, headquartered in New York at first and then in Washington, D.C. Let's look at some of the reasons. Well, they cited the Bible, but as you know, you can cite the Bible for almost anything you want, and so there, there were reasons in there. The cult of domesticity was very popular in the late 1800s. This was the argument that women's places in the home where they are the nurturers of the family, their skills should be used to raise the children, make the home a comforting place for the whole family. Many women bought into that and didn't want to have anything to do with suffrage. And that includes um, New Hampshire's own Sarah Josepha Hale, who was the publisher of Lady uh, Godey's Ladies Book. Um, she was an anti-suffragist, but she promoted all these other things that women should do. Uh, women are mentally and emotionally unsuited to voting. Politics is no place for a woman. And that sign in the lower right was part of that Smithsonian exhibit. Women are too pure for the dirty pool of politics. And below it was a sign that said, women are used to cleaning up after men. If the pool of politics is dirty, we'll clean it. Okay. Women don't want the vote. And as I said, some did not. Women are too busy. This one I can believe. Far, uh, now, there's one that the farmers used. Farm wives can't get to town to vote because they're too busy with the chickens and all the farm chores and so on. So if women get the right to vote, the city vote will be doubled and farmers will lose power. Interesting. The liquor industry, of course, was opposed to women voting because women would vote for prohibition. Well, duh, that's what the whole women's temperance movement was about. And now I have to read to you from Farmer Radford. Now, a friend of mine from Warner, New Hampshire found this editorial in the 1915 Kearsarge Independent and Times Weekly. And Farmer Radford starts this way. The home is the greatest contribution of women to the world, and the hearthstone is her throne. Our social structure is built around her, and social righteousness is in her charge. And he goes on in that cloying way for a while. And then eventually he closes this way. But directing the affairs of government is not within woman's sphere, and political gossip would cause her to neglect the home, forget to mend our clothes, and burn the biscuits. So that's why we can't have women voting. All right, there we go. But the biggest opposition really was the states' rights issue that states should decide whether women should vote or not. So this caused the second big rift in the women's suffrage movement. There were those who said we should keep working state by state to get women's rights to vote enshrined in state constitutions. And those who said we'll never get all the states to do that and therefore we must work for a federal suffrage amendment. So look at this wonderful map that shows when women were first allowed to vote for president. The gray states, there are four of them, are places where women had full voting rights before they were even states. They adopted this in their territorial constitutions. And that includes Wyoming, 1869, they granted women full voting rights. Is that because Wyoming men are so much nicer than the rest of the country? Well, maybe. Or maybe it has something to do with the fact that the proportion of men to women was six to one 
in Wyoming at that time. And as one legislator at the time said, if we give women the right to vote, maybe some well-educated women from the East will come to Wyoming and become our school teachers, our librarians. He didn't say it, but he's also thinking, and our wives. You know, so there was a reason why some of these territories wanted to give women full voting rights. In the blue states, women had full voting rights before the 19th Amendment took effect. What do you notice about where the gray and blue states are for the most part? They're out west, yep. And there were other reasons, uh, had something to do with the silver standard for money and all kinds of other reasons, but the West was far more liberal in terms of these voting rights. So you'll see that New York state is blue. It got voting rights for women in 1917 as a result of that push by the gilded suffragists and the labor organizers in that state. And um, Michigan got voting rights uh, the year before, 1919. But otherwise, it was out west. So the green states, women had some voting rights, um, but not complete ones. Here in New Hampshire, women could vote for school board, for instance, in the 1880s, but that's as far as it went. So the orange or gold-colored states, women had to wait for the 19th Amendment before they had full voting rights. I, I just love this map. But before they got those full voting rights, World War I came along. And even before we entered the war in April of 1917, women were going to the cities to take the jobs of the men who had left to go fight in Europe. The YWCA provided safe housing for women. The Red Cross was of course recruiting women for the nursing corps. Women were even being recruited for farm work, the land army it was called. But if you look at the knees, the, the words between the knees of these characters, it says, until the boys come back. This was never thought of as permanent jobs. This is just to fill the necessary jobs while the men are away. So what are women doing? These delicate women, too, too tender to vote. Well, they're working in the mines. They're working in heavy industry. They're sewing flags at the Brooklyn Navy Yard by the thousands. They are making munitions. By 1918, the munitions industry was the largest employer of women in this country of any industry. They were working in heavy industry at the shipyards, at the rail yards, and you see them there in work clothes. They would never go out on the streets like that, but they'd change into work clothes. Here's a close up of some women at the uh, steel company. And women are doing this hard work. Without it, the men would not have been able to go and fight the war. They were also taking men's place as streetcar conductors, as police officers, and now they're wearing uniforms. And that changes the way society looks at women. When you see them in uniform, doing this important necessary work that they'd never thought women would do. And uh, here are some other women in uniform. Uh, the Red Cross Motor Pool, the Women's Motor Corps in France, these women not only drove the ambulances, they repaired them when they broke down. They were a vital part of the war effort. There's a wonderful book and one hour TV documentary called The Hello Girls. And uh, this was uh, the idea of the um, Army Signal Corps to recruit college educated women to go to France and serve as bilingual telephone operators for the allied forces. Every good college girl spoke French fluently at that point. So they had all these women, they thought they were in the army and the story of how they were kind of conned out of that status is a fascinating one. But there was no doubt that the Navy was recruiting women during World War I because they realized that um, they 
they could do the clerk's job and free up the men for the shipboard jobs because somebody realized that a Navy yeoman, which means a Navy clerk, did not mean yo man. It could be a woman. So there were 11,000 women in the US Navy in World War I. Meanwhile, stateside, uh, the suffragists are still lobbying Congress for the federal amendment. They are trying to talk with the president and get his support for it. And along comes Carrie Chapman Catt, who was handpicked by Susan B. Anthony to take over this largest two million women, two million members rather, largest of the suffrage organizations. Um, and her winning plan, she had been working in the states for years, getting civil rights and voting rights in the states. And she said, we'll keep working on that, but only so that when we have an amendment, there'll be enough states to ratify it. it. Takes three quarters of the states to ratify it. So she combined these efforts for a federal amendment with work in the states. And she was the director of this National American Women's Suffrage Association right up until the passage of the amendment. Now here is a much younger suffragist. This is the famous Alice Paul. College educated, she'd gone to England um, to, to, to study, but also she met the suffragists there, the Pankhursts, whom you may have heard of. And the suffragists in England were far more militant than the ones in this country. Uh, in fact, they, were called, they adopted the name suffragette. And that's the first time I've used that tonight. That was not an American term. It was given to the suffrage movement by a newspaper that was trying to diminish them. You know, like a dinette is a cute little dining set, not very important. So a suffragette, these women who are trying to do something. But just like some black men now adopt that N-word that we don't use for themselves, the suffragettes in England adopted that term and wore it proudly. They, as I said, they were far more militant. They uh, blew up railroads. They tried to uh, burn down the prime minister's house and so on. Well, Alice Paul was raised a good Quaker girl. She was not about to do that. But she did learn the principle that if the party in power is not giving you what you want, you hold them accountable. So by 2016, Woodrow Wilson has been president for four years and has done nothing for women's suffrage. Granted, he had other things on his mind. He was trying to stop the war in Europe before it started. And then when it looked like he couldn't stop it, he was trying to figure out, do we go into it or not? But uh, you know, as far as Alice Paul and these militants are concerned, he is a disaster. So the signs you see here are at one of his campaign parades, and we're going to try to argue against Woodrow Wilson. Early in 1917, and we're not yet at war officially, um, Alice Paul's party stations silent sentinels in front of the White House. Six days a week, different, different groups of women are stationed there holding signs, trying to pressure President Wilson to use the power of the bully pulpit to get Congress to pass a federal amendment. That's what they wanted. And all went along fine for a few months until the US did enter the war that April. Uh, and you see the sign on the right, it's a little bit nastier. The, uh, suddenly the, these nice peaceful protesters in front of the White House are considered anti-patriotic. And so there was violence. And uh, some of the spectators tore at the women's clothes, threw things at them, tore down their banners. And so there were arrests, not of the spectators who do this, but of the suffragists. And this is uh, Alice Paul's second in command, Lucy Stone, at Occoquan Workhouse as a prisoner. Eventually, 168, I think, women 
were imprisoned for either a short time or a long time. Alice Paul spent a total of seven months in jail um, for her suffrage activities. And Occoquan Workhouse had been closed. It was so filthy and vermin infested that it was not used. They opened it so that they could put the suffragists in there. It did not stop Alice Paul's National Woman's Party. She kept picketing the White House. And finally, on February in 1919, they burned President Wilson in effigy. Now, this sounds very dramatic until you read closely and you find out that it was a two foot tall paper doll of Wilson that they burned in this pot, along with his speeches. But they were still trying to get him to agree to use his influence with Congress. Eventually, he did agree to this. When the war was over, he realized the war would not have been won without the efforts of the women, both those in the military and overseas, and the ones filling necessary jobs here. So he did make a speech to Congress in January of 1918. Uh, the House passed it, passed the federal amendment. The Senate did not. He now starts lobbying individually. And finally, uh, the Senate and House have both passed the amendment by June of 1919. Now, all we need are 36 state legislators, legislatures, to ratify the amendment. All right, let's see what happens. Every time a state legislature ratifies it, Alice Paul sews one more flag on her National Woman's Party banner. New Hampshire was the 16th state. But we get up to spring of 1920. They've been working almost a year on this. We've got 35 states. We need 36. Interestingly, Vermont and Connecticut, which were really pro-women's suffrage states, did not ratify it because their governors refused to call a special session to vote on this. Those were the days when the state legislature met every other year. So we get to 35 states. What are we going to do? Where do we find the 36? And we find it in Tennessee. Granted, it's a southern state. States' rights are an issue. But actually, they had granted white women some suffrage, uh, most, most of the suffrage rights before that. So it seemed a fair bet. But you can see there was opposition in the poster on the right at the Ryman Auditorium to save the South from the Susan B. Anthony Amendment and federal force bills. They're still thinking reconstruction. We don't want the federal government telling us what to do. So that summer, July and August of 1920, the suffragists and the anti-suffragists descend on Nashville. Special session of the legislature. They're trying to nab every single legislator and get him to vote the way they want. Red roses were the symbol for the suffragists. I'm sorry, yellow for the suffragists. Red roses for the antis. And so they would do all kinds of feminine in things like inviting a gentleman legislator to dinner and sweet talking him. And if he agreed to vote their way, he would get the little boutonniere here of the symbol. And then there were some other things that were a little nastier. It's, it's a fascinating story of just those two months when this was going on. Well, eventually the um, Senate did ratify the amendment. So now we just need the House to do it. And we're getting down to the last day of arguments before they're due to take a vote. And as far as anyone could see, it was going to be a tied vote. And as you know, a tie does not win. So they were seriously worried. But on that last day of arguments, Harry Byrne, the youngest legislator, was handed a note on the floor of the house. It was from his mother. And it said, 
hurrah and vote for suffrage. Don't keep them in doubt. And it closes, don't forget to be a good boy and help Mrs. Cat, Carrie Chapman Cat. Now, Harry Byrne had been assumed by the suffragists to be an anti-suffragist, and that would make the tie vote. But as the roll call happened, Harry Byrne votes yes to ratification. All heck breaks loose, all right. And then one of the other legislators who until then had been abstaining from votes, apparently drew courage from young 24-year-old Harry Byrne and he voted yes. And the amendment has passed that closely. So they come back the next day for some procedural business and Harry Byrne asks to speak on the floor of the house. And he says, I voted for suffrage because it was the right thing to do, but also because it is always good for a boy to follow the direction of his mother. So there, we owe it to Phoebe Burns. So here is the amendment. Seems simple enough, doesn't it? There's a force enforcement clause that follows it. That was August 18th that it passed in Tennessee. And by August 26th, it gets to the US Secretary of State who signs it into law in the dead of night without any ceremony. Now that just was unfair. So what happens next? That November, 1920, eight million women cast ballots. There are about 20 million women in the country. Some of them couldn't vote in the Southern states, especially because the Southern states said you missed the deadline to register, so you can't cast a ballot. And there are other reasons, and we'll get to those in a minute. But this, the, the, during this ratification process, um, the suffragists said now that women have the right to vote, they need to learn how to use it. They need to learn how to register, how to study the issues. And so every state that ratified the amendment met in convention of the suffrage organization and changed its name to League of Women Voters. So it grew right out of that. Women took their role as voters seriously. And we've got some wonderful historic photos. We have a story right here from Keene, New Hampshire um, that my friend Jenna Carroll at the Historical Society uncovered. Apparently some of the women didn't like registering to vote because they were first of all asked their names and they were used to being called Mrs. John Smith, the polite way. Now they had to say, my name is Mary Smith. How personal can you get? And then they were asked their age. Well, women don't do that. They don't give their ages. But the best story that Jenna uncovered was when one woman uh, went to register to vote and we were still doing literacy tests at that point. So she was given a piece of paper and asked to read this. And she looked at the young man who was the registrar and said, young man, I was your third grade teacher. Of course, I know how to read. Anyway, women had to learn how to cope with all that. But right away, women started running for office. And these are two women from New Hampshire who ran for the New Hampshire House immediately. Uh, they had missed the filing deadline which was in June or something, you know, and the amendment didn't happen until August. So they had to run as write-ins. One's a Republican, one's a Democrat. They both won their elections. So right in 1920, we have our first two female state legislators. But who was not voting in 1920? Well, Native Americans didn't get citizenship rights until 1924. So despite the influence of the Haudenosaunee way back there in 1848, they were not voting. Chinese-born immigrants like Mabel Pinghua Lee didn't get citizenship until 1943. We don't know that she ever voted. 
In the South, black men had been intimidated, threatened, uh, various laws promulgated to keep them from voting, and black women in the South faced the same thing after 1920. And it wasn't until President Johnson signed the 1965 Voting Rights Act that put some teeth in enforcing voting rights that blacks in the South were able to vote uh, with reasonable safety. And of course, 18, 19, and 20 year olds couldn't vote until 1971 when we lowered the voting age from 21. But by the 1960s, women were a distinct voting block voting their own kind of set of norms uh, distinct from men. And by 1980 and continuing right to this day, more women than men vote. So what became of the suffragists? Well, I already told you that the National American Women's Suffrage Association morphed into the League of Women Voters uh, with chapters in every state, many local units, nonpartisan efforts to help women understand the process and learn to study the issues. Alice Paul's National Woman's Party immediately started campaigning for an equal rights amendment. And the anti-suffragists, the National American Organization, of, not, I'm sorry, opposed to women's suffrage, uh, they dissolved, but they kept anti-communist, anti-labor, they, they were in an anti-mood. So we're going to end with two contemporary photos. This is Jan the New York Times, January 2013, because the previous December, New Hampshire became the first state in the nation to have an all-female congressional delegation, and we elected a female governor. So that's Governor Maggie Hassan on the left, Congresswomen Annie Custer and Carol Shea Porter, and U.S. Senators Kelly Ayotte and Jean Shaheen. So we made the front page of the New York Times in color. And then, of course, on the 100th anniversary of that first election in which women could vote, we have our first female vice president, Kamala Harris, elected. And with that, I will end this. I thank you so much for being here. And if you have questions or comments, I'd love to hear them. Thank you.